With authority. Welcome to another quarantine edition of the With Authority podcast. We got a full house. Larry Beal, Casey Pratt, Chris Alvarez, and our special guest, who we are thrilled to get, the new and, might I add, still undefeated manager <laughs> of the San Francisco <laughs> Giants, Game Kaplan. I know you, you actually wish you had a record at this point, but uh, before we get started here, uh, where are you? What are you up to in these uh, bizarre times that we're living in? Yeah, I'm, st I'm still in Scottsdale. Um, there's a few of us still here. Most everyone, including players and our Major League field staff, have left Scottsdale and, and headed home to get settled in. Uh, there were just a few loose ends that, that needed to be tied up. And, you know, quite frankly, I can still get outside and take a walk, get back in and get all my work done. Um, it just seems like there's a lot of open-ended time right now. So uh, I just haven't been in a rush to get back. But, but I actually am, for the first time, starting to get anxious and, and want to get back to the Bay Area and get settled. So I thought we would do this a little bit differently than we've done the previous podcasts. Um, I, I have a lot of research on you. Uh, <laughs> is that, is that how you keep your research like, <laughs> scribbled on? on <laughs> that's awesome. It's, it's better than like cutting newspaper articles and putting the letters and gluing right. them. So yeah. <laughs> well, with, those are with the, Zoom, with the Zoom call, I just figured you'd have like technology in front of you, maybe an iPad or something. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Thanks. Thanks. Uh, the first, let it, let the record show you, Ron, the first insult was from Gabe Kapler. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, so I wanted to do this kind of like, like Jeopardy because there's so many different things that we could talk to you about. So here are the categories, and we, you get to choose what category you want to start with. I thought we would go inside baseball, nutrition, scotch, which may or may not be the same category as nutrition, <laughs> classical piano, and Japan. Those are our, our first five categories. Wow. We have cap for a hundred dollars. Where would you like to start? Let's start with nutrition. <laughs> I think I'll, okay. I'll take nutrition. Do I have like a hundred through five hundred, or are we just starting at the bottom? We have no plan, Gabe. This, <laughs> this would be. Oh, are you? Are you? Are you? Is it like nutrition go, or are you about to ask? Give me a fact. <laughs> <I'm> gonna... <laughs> we probably should have talked about this before we started. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, why don't you do 10 minutes on nutrition and then I'll ask a follow-up. No, no. <laughs> no, but actually, this is a, a really good time. And I'm, I'm trying to be serious here for like five seconds. But when everybody's talking about their immune systems and coronavirus and things like that, I mean, you, I'm, I'm not saying you're a self-taught, quote-unquote, nutritionist, but you're a guy that was known for your physique and you've been working on uh, nutrition for years. Uh, 4% body fat at one point. I don't know where you still are. So we have some stuff in common, you and I. But uh, <laughs> anyway, what, what, are you, what are you eating? What are, are you all organic? What are you doing to keep your immune system up at this point? Yeah, well, let's start. Let's stay on the, the serious note for, for just a moment. I mean, part of being responsible here is obviously practicing social distancing, um, considering ourselves asymptomatic carriers. Um, and, and I think the, the best thing that we can possibly do is, is stay home as much as possible, obvious. So um, that includes cooking. And for me, I've been doing a, a lot more cooking and uh, kind of coincides nicely with, with the nutrition question. Uh, I, I'm, I'm big on you know, eating a, a ribeye steak and, and I have a few, you know, I have a salad in the, in the refrigerator, so I'm eating a few green leaves and, and that's basically uh, what, what my diet, diet consists of right now. I'm using a sous vide and the sous vide gets the meat up to a very specific temperature and holds that temperature for as long as you need it to. So you could step away and do a call for an hour and a half and uh, it's a hot water bath that you drop a, a steak into in a Ziploc bag and it gets up to 133 and a half degrees and it just sits there like at, at a medium rare. And then when you take the steak out, you drop it in a cast iron pan with some butter and um, you know put it one side for 45 seconds the other side for 45 seconds and you've got a pretty perfectly cooked ribeye steak that feels like a pretty healthy meal to me and probably my go-to right now um, over the course of the last three weeks well I don't even know what a sous vide is but I'll look it up after the podcast yeah, no, it's, it's like it's like a hot water bath right it's a it's a tub um, it, it keeps the water at a specific temperature and it just kind of slow cooks the meat, but never gets it above that temperature. So there's no, there's no real risk of overcooking. So people 
who have to check text messages, emails, go, want to go catch a workout. You can just drop that thing in a Ziploc bag and come back and, and the stakes at the temperature that you want it to be at. All right. Wow. All right. Uh, Casey, how about nutrition for 200? Honestly, for me, I would like to know just as somebody that is maintaining nutrition at that very level, how hard is it to stock up right now? How challenging is it to get the groceries and the food and everything you need and exercise so social distancing at the same time? No, I think, I think that's a great question. Um, it's not easy. So one of the things that I've done is I have a, a spray bottle, like an antivirus, antibacterial spray bottle that some of us have in our homes. I carry it with me. I carry antibacterial soap uh, with me in a backpack. And if I need to go to the grocery store, I go to the grocery store and make sure that I'm washing my hands before I walk in the grocery store. And if I'm picking up two or three packages of, of steaks or short ribs or something along those lines, and, and I'm putting it back, I'm making sure to, you know, to wipe it down. Because again, we're, we're thinking about this, even though I'm, I'm not symptomatic, but we are, we're all trying to think about this as if we were carrying the virus to protect other people. It's not as much about, hey, I, I don't want to go out and get sick. It's more, I don't want to get anybody else sick. Um, so I'm just taking like, kind of protective measures to try to keep the people around me safe and don't spend a lot of time in the grocery store. Try not to go in very often. So if I do go in, it's once in a while, once every 10 days, stock up and, and go back when I can. Uh, and, it's, and it feels like that's what, what most people are, are thinking about and, and, and that's what I'm hoping for. I'm gonna, well, if I may, um, really, really quick though. Does, does the Giants um, chef or nutritionist or anybody, or even you, do you provide input or advice to the players that are now stuck in their homes and maybe not familiar with cooking or taking care of themselves like this? Yeah, we have, we have an outstanding team dietitian. Um, her name is Larone, and she stays in, in touch with, with all of our players. They produced how-to videos. Um, and this is kind of the, one of the uh, creative ways that our organization is able to stay in touch with our players right now. Uh, so Larone is staying in close contact, offering up nutrition advice and offering up cooking advice. And so, um, you know, everybody in, in our uh, baseball operations department can be privy to that information. It's been uh, a really cool initiative that, that we've all been very supportive of. This is all along the lines of nutrition, but also with workouts. You were mentioning videos, Gabe. What are your players doing as far as workouts? I mean, it's just so different. Are you guys sending them stuff? How are they keeping in? in baseball shape, wherever they may be? I think there's a number of ways that our players are able to stay in baseball shape right now. But um, I just pulled up a, a Wilmer Flores Instagram post where I believe his wife is, is flipping him um, baseballs and he's driving them into a net in, in South Florida right now in their, in their yard. So um, again, like this is uncharted territory. We're, we're, we're trying to be creative in the way that we prepare for the season. Um, not sure if you guys have been following how our organization and how our one of our hitting coaches, Justin Bealy, uses the video game uh, MLB The Show to stay sharp and, and up to speed on opposing pitchers around the National League. Uh, I'm doing it as well. I'm playing a couple games a, a day. Um, they have this, this mode called manage mode, and it's like a simulation where you're just making the decisions throughout the game. And uh, recently, uh, Brandon Crawford was the player of the game on my of that day and I took a, a, shot, a picture of the screen and sent it over to him and the work that he'd done in that game and thought it was really cool he sent me back uh, a picture of, of the work that he was doing in, in an NBA video game uh, he'd scored 71 points and, and dished, dished out nine assists so yeah we're all just kind of being playful and and at the same time getting really good productive work done um, and we're using things like you know video games to stay connected these, these video games are so real. Are you happy with how you look in the video game? Is it, is it a real replication of Gabe Kapler? I, I don't even know. But what I, what I do know is that they've done a really deep statistic dive um, to come up with like player, player value, player talent. Um, so it's kind of fun to see how this, this video game company has, has rated these players and some good stuff online about uh, the way they've come to those numbers. And uh, it makes the game more realistic. And, um, I can certainly speak to the, the realistic feel of the game itself. They've done a good job. You could actually call Dave Roberts and manage against him. Giants, Dodgers, before we have Giants, Dodgers for real, right? Yeah, you know what? I've, I've been thinking about stuff like that. Um, 
So it's, it's not just this video game, right? There's some really cool computer simulation games out there that if you wanted to familiarize yourself with, with different teams around the National League and, and their most updated rosters, you can do that. So um, while I might not call Dave Roberts, you can bet that you know, people around the game are using tools like that to, to um, stay sharp both mentally and then on the, on the physical side, our, our coaches are sending drills and long toss programs, throwing programs to both our pitchers and our, our position players. So there's a lot of different ways we can be productive during this time. And um, interestingly, like we as a crew have been, and as a crew, I mean, like our, our major league baseball coaches and players have been very, very productive during this very strange um, time. And as I said, it's definitely uncharted waters. Gabe, I'm Your just curious, real, real quick, what game is it? Is it is it The Show or is it something else? Yeah, that video game that I was referencing is MLB The Show 20. Okay. okay. Chris played college baseball, so I know he wants to get into uh, inside baseball for 100. So we should just go there now, right? Because I know you're dying to ask baseball questions. Uh, <laughs> I was going to ask a fun one later. But, Gabe, um, when, when originally when this all hit, the coronavirus, um, what was that like for you guys? I think we all thought it was going to be a couple weeks, and obviously it's gotten so serious and we don't know what's happening. But can you take us back to the moment when spring training got canceled or suspended indefinitely? Sure. I mean, we had a, we had a shortened game by rain, the, a game that Kevin Gosman had pitched, and he pitched really well um, and used all his pitches and built his volume up. We were really excited. He was prepared the next time out, I think, to go five innings and, and 75 pitches. So we're starting to inch towards – at the time, what was what was going to be opening day, and um, guys like Gosman and, and Drew Smiley were were seemingly really sharp. Uh, I had just had a conversation after that game um, with with one of our beat writers about that Johnny Cueto would would start on opening day, and at that point, everything seemed fairly normal because we had just come off the field and played in front of of thousands of fans and surprise against the Rangers. So that's where that's where the mood was. And then things started to, to unfold very, very quickly. Um, and, and all of us around the industry started to get focused less on baseball and, and much more on keeping society healthy. And um, I think since that's been the number one priority. Casey? Yeah, I'll jump in. I want, I want to go inside, inside baseball. You're back to when you were a player. Uh, we were re-watching an airing of a game that I happened to be sitting in the crowd for, uh, Dallas Braden's perfect game. And we noticed you were the last out in that game. So what, what was that day like? Yeah, you know, this is, this is, uh, this is kind of sensitive because I've been part of, a part of two perfect oh. games and made outs in, in both of those perfect games. And the other one that was aired recently was the Mark Burley perfect game in Chicago. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the Dallas Braden perfect game, it, it just kind of felt – for us as the Rays, pretty uneventful, like a lot of ground balls, a lot of early contact, not a lot of deep counts. Um, so that's what I remember. In the ninth inning, I think I hit a sharp ground ball to shortstop, and, and that, that was a recorded out. And then in the Chicago game, I hit a ball that, that I thought was going to be at least a double, um, and I thought it was, you know, potentially even go out of the park. And Dwayne Wise, the center fielder at the time for the Chicago White Sox, went up on the wall and made one of the, the better catches in Oh, in yeah. Baseball. I remember that catch. Yeah. 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 And, and that preserved the, the perfect game for Burley. Um, I remember feeling at the time, like, that, that kind of sucks. You know, the home run wasn't recorded. But then I felt pretty immediately after that happy for the game of baseball because Burley ended up with the perfect game. Dwayne Wise obviously went down in history as making one of the, the better catches in, in recent memory. Um, and I think we're all better off having that perfect game. I, I will say this, Chris Young, who now works at Major League Baseball, tall right-handed pitcher, um, had a perfect game in Milwaukee, and I believe we were in the eighth inning, and I, and I hit a home run off of him um, in 2008. So while I was part of two on the short end of the stick, I was able to break up uh, his perfect game in, in the eighth inning that day. That's fascinating. Cool. Absolutely. So Let's, let's take a deeper dive into your playing career because 12 years, Tigers, Rangers, Rockies, you were part of the Red Sox team that broke the curse. Uh, first title in 86 years, that was in 04. Brewers, Yomi Yuri Giants, 
in Japan, yes. which had to be a really interesting experience. And you mentioned the Rays. With all of those experiences, how do you think that that prepared you to be the manager of the San Francisco Giants? What would you learn? Yeah, no, I, I appreciate having the opportunity to answer this question. Uh, I think with all those teams, I, I played different roles. So uh, with the Tigers, like you mentioned, I came up as the number one prospect in the organization um, and as their everyday center fielder. So I kind of got to see the game from, I don't know, like somebody like um, Hunter Bishop for us, like a, a, a guy with some pedigree and um, somebody who was coming up as, as a touted prospect. And then as I got, as I got moved around, I, I went from being an everyday player who hit 300 at the major league level to really a, a role player and, and somebody who was more thought of as the 24th or the 25th man on a, on a couple of the rosters I've played on. As you mentioned, I, I played in Japan. Um, I kind of, as my career went on, was more of like a player coach late in my career. So saw the game from the angle of, of somebody like Terry Francona, or, or Joe Madden and the moves that they were making in game. And so got to see it from that perspective. So I can kind of relate to a lot of different players as a result of playing for all of those teams, for all of those managers, and, and saw the game from a lot of different perspectives. And I, don't, I wouldn't want it any other way. I, you know, I think if you're a really good baseball player for a really long time, an everyday player, somebody who does great things in the game like Will Clark, you're going to see that game from through the lens of a superstar. Um, and, you know, I bring up Will because he's in the organization. He's a great teacher and, and such a great resource to so many of our, our young hitters and, and a lot of us as coaches. But I, I've just, I've seen it from a, a lot of different angles and, and I really appreciate having that perspective. Obviously, Gabe, you guys would have been in season by now, but can you, it's hard. Everybody says it's hard to replicate when you leave a clubhouse as a when you retire as a player. Now you're still around the game. Did you always know you wanted to be a manager and stay in baseball for as long as you could? So you still have that uh, routine and that thing about being around guys in the clubhouse and being around the game. No, I, I really like how you ask that question because it it's not the between the lines that you miss when you get out of the game. Um, at least for me, I don't want to speak for everybody, but it's. It's, it's the preparation, it's the clubhouse environment. It's little things like pulling up your socks and or putting on your spikes or like taking, taking your feet into the dirt on, on a major league field and running around the outfield, like all of those little things. And as a coach or somebody who gets to stay in the game with a uniform on, you get to continue to experience all of those things. So you don't have that, you know, that longing for what you did from the time you were five years old until like for me into my mid thirties and feeling like, Oh, there's something missing. I'm not getting to do this thing. Mm -hmm. So while, yeah, I, I always loved game strategy and that was something that I've always been fascinated with staying in the game for me is really about um, the sensory experiences like the ones I just mentioned. Yeah. And the only way to do that is to keep putting on the uniform. Yeah. I feel the same way about the TV makeup. You know, I still yeah. get put on every day. Uh, you were, you did some TV for a while, didn't you? In LA, didn't you do some TV? I, I did, and I and I had that experience with Fox, and so we did a show called Fox Sports Live, which was uh, Fox Sports One's version yep. of like a Sports Center. It was a highlight show, uh, but we also did it with a panel. So Gary Payton, um, Donovan McNabb, Andy Roddick, Carissa Thompson. Like this was a we had this panel, and we had lots of lively discussions and debates. And then there was another show that we did called Whip Around, which was much more like Baseball Tonight is for, for ESPN and um, also covered the All-Star Game, um, did some work on, on the World Series. So yeah, I got to see that, you know, the game from that angle as well. And um, that was actually a really fun time. The thing that I thought was really cool about that is when the red light went on, you had to have something to say. So it created an adrenaline similar to something like getting in the batter's box. You know, you, you have to take an action step or as a manager, a big moment in the game when you can make one decision or the other, you don't have a choice. You have to make that decision. So um, there's some similarities as it relates to the adrenaline that you get from doing TV. It's funny you mentioned Gary Payton because he lives about five minutes away from me. And uh, well, the only difference between our houses it's about 10,000 square feet and a huge gate in front of his house. <laughs> Otherwise, it's kind of the same. It's almost the same. That's funny. <laughs> uh, next category. What do you want to pick for your next category? 
Oh, let's do, let's do, well, we covered Japan, didn't we? Well, we a, could, a little bit. How's your Japanese? Did you learn any Japanese? Uh, I, so I don't even remember what this means, but I practiced it over and over. It's watashi no naame. Oh, I'm not even going to keep going. <laughs> I, I'm just trying, I'm trying to remember back to, to that time period and some of the phrases that I repeated over and over. Um, I, my Japanese is, is not good, obviously, but um, I, I, did, I did think about it a lot and, and work on it before I went over there. Any of you guys speak any other languages? Well, my wife is half Japanese, so she was going to run and translate for you, but uh, we didn't even get halfway through the sentence. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> I, 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 des I deserve that criticism for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I, let's, let's say we covered Japan, even though we could probably do a half an hour on Japan. Um, you want to go analytics, you want to go scotch. Uh, there's also a kind of a crazy ice cream story that I read. I don't know. If, yeah. Like some of the stuff that I've read, is it's that, almost that, like you're the most ice interesting. Cream for, ice cream for 100 or something like that. Yeah, we could do that. But it's like you're the most interesting man in the world. You have all these diverse stories. And I, I don't even know which one of them, which one of these are real. Like. So I, you want to go ice cream? Yeah, let's go ice cream. I mean, I, th this is a story that ha is is a lot of fun, but has really been embellished. It's like <laughs> very very much a, a game of telephone. So uh, the story goes I, like I think I was in my very early twenties and on just a very very strict routine at the time, um, and I could sort of feel my discipline waning a little bit. I was kind of you know, beginning to crack a little bit during this time period of getting ready for a season. And um, I was with my girlfriend at the time and she, she had an ice cream cone in her hand. So rather than like completely breaking, I asked her for a bite of the ice cream cone, took a bite of the ice cream cone, tasted it and spit it out. So that became like the thing that I did. Whereas I think it was the only time in my life that I did it, but it became a story that people ask me about and, and ask me about to this day. It's a lot of fun because I love ice cream. It's probably, you know, if you ask me um, what my favorite dessert is, that, that'd probably be it. Yeah, I was going to go that route. The like, story. A big cheat meal for you if you're going <laughs> to cheat on a meal. Yeah. Um, I mean, I do this like fairly regularly. So, you know, once every couple of weeks, but uh, deep dish pizza, really, really cold beer followed by salted caramel gelato. Wow. wow. How, how specific is that? Is that good enough? That's pretty specific. Is there a, a city in the, in the majors that you like to visit the most if you're going to break down and have one of those uh, cheap meals? Or is there a favorite city you like to go to, whether it's for the stadium or for the food? Like, is, is there one? San Francisco has a pretty good food scene. So yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable in San Francisco. Some really good ice cream in San Francisco. Chicago has you know amazing deep dish pizza and you know i can get a, i can get an ice cold beer just about anywhere yeah but yeah look chicago is a great place to go in the summer seattle is one of my favorite cities in the country great ballpark still to this day um among the newer ballparks as good as any that's out there um boston's a great city to travel to i'm, I'm from los angeles i think la is has, has a lot of great things to offer as well so i'm I love to travel and um, I love the cities in our country. Just about, I could find something to do, something to eat in, in any of our cities. <laughs> How do you feel about prime rib? Love it, love it. And have def are you about to bring up a house of prime rib? <laughs> did, did, did you read my script? Did you read oh, this? I, well, I mean, <laughs> we're, we're, we're talking about restaurants, we're talking about cities and you say, how do you feel about prime rib? That means we're about to go to the house of prime rib. I've had, I've stopped in a couple of times, um, get the biggest cut. I, I, I really enjoy it. I mean, I've been cooking um, short rib in, in the house using that same sous vide uh, metric or uh, tool. So um, definitely, definitely in on, on both of those things. Well, whenever all of this ends and we get back to normal, you're our guest at the house of prime rib. We're Is that right? The owner, Joe Betts. And so uh, we'll set that up and, uh, you know, that'll, that'll be fun. And, uh, you know, we could, we could certainly do that. Is it this crew right here? Or are we going to go like, we're going to go break bread, eat prime rib and drink wine? That sounds pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If that's, if that's what you want to do, I mean, we'll, we'll do whatever you want to do. You're the guest. You're driving this. 
is is this are going to be part of like a, a Zoom broadcast where we're <laughs> can we make a show out of it? Hopefully, we don't need Zoom anymore by that point. That's a good. <laughs> yeah, That's a good we. I'm sure Joe Betts, the owner, would love us to make a show out of it. Uh, I'm not sure that we can. We, we can do something. We'll figure something out. I um, love it. Count yeah. me in. I'd love to do that with you guys. Sounds Excellent. Good. Casey, you want you got our next category? You want to go somewhere? I want to take this back to Hollywood, if possible. Can we do a little Hollywood action? I know you went to high school in Hollywood. Did you grow up with any movie stars? I know that there's a lot of like famous alum from your high school. That's funny. Um, so. I didn't grow up in Hollywood. I was born in a Hollywood hospital, um, but I actually grew up right in the middle of the San Fernando Valley. Okay. And then, um, so the San Fernando Valley is like, you know, 20 miles north of, of downtown Los Angeles. And it's a, it's a really mixed bag. It's a really interesting place to grow up. My high school is called Taft High School. It wasn't the district that I grew up in. I grew up in, a, in the district for Reseda High School, but Taft High School at the time had a, a better baseball program and I was able to, to get in there. So the famous alumni from, from Taft, um, Ice Cube is, is the most famous. Um, Robin Yount, if you want to go far back, is, is wow. definitely the best baseball player to ever come out of there. There's some, been some NBA players that have come out of Taft. Steve Smith, the wide receiver for, for the Giants for a long time, uh, he came out of Taft High School. Gwyneth Paltrow is a, a Taft wow. High School alum. So yeah, there's, there's some people who have come out of the school that have gone on to do things that um, have made them celebrities. I would imagine, Gabe, and I, I don't know this off the top of my head, you probably played several sports in high school. Did, why was it baseball? Did you play football, basketball? And, and how far did you go in those other sports? I was going to say, speaking of football, I think Steve Fisher, the NFL head coach, was also a, a Taft alum. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we can we can verify that later um yeah no i i played i played exclusively baseball in high school um it, the environment was year-round baseball in the san fernando valley when i was growing up so i mean i'm a huge football fan i'm a huge basketball fan i never got too much into hockey but i can share that you know i i follow i watch any sport and in high school it was just it was year-round baseball for me Gotcha. So I have a question along those lines because nowadays everybody's into the, the saber metrics and launch angle and spin rate. There's just a million different categories. As you were coming up in the game, would all of that information have helped you or hurt you? Because sometimes it's it's paralysis by analysis. And you know, like I, I still remember talking to Barry Bonds. And like Barry didn't get, give up a lot to guys like myself, but it would be, you know, see ball, hit ball was obviously there was a lot more going on and he was extraordinary in terms of his skills. But where do you, where do you come down on the information in baseball now? Yeah. I mean, I love it because I'm, I'm kind of a nerd. I like to dig into that stuff, but I can tell you as a, as a baseball player, it, it's really, um, you just simplify it. Right. So you, you want to hit the ball with a high line drive trajectory. You want to hit it as hard as you can and good things are going to happen. So now we measure that, the angle that, that you hit the baseball and, and how the exit velocity, how fast it comes off the bat. And we just kind of put some numbers to it, but it's kind of similar to what we thought about when we hit off a tee in the cage in, in 2003, right? You're trying to hit a ball at the top of the cage, at the back of the cage, hit it as hard as you can and try to make it carry. And, if you put instruments in the cage now to measure those things, now numbers are just being put to it. So um, I don't know. I, it felt like something that we knew as, as a player coming up. And as I got later in my career, a lot of these technologies started to, to come to, to the forefront, as well as you know, um, deeper or, or more robust analytics and, and numbers. But I think you can just boil it down to analytics being information and, and that information can come in all sorts of forms. So if you take a scout and he goes to, to watch an amateur player, he's going to evaluate that player on a 20 to 80 scale. And if he evaluates him at an 80, I mean, he's like a hall of famer kind of once in a generation type player. And if he evaluates him as a 20, he, he just doesn't really have any value to a major league team. 
But really what he's saying is this guy's on the, on the 80 end is a, a, a ridiculous level superstar. The guy on the 20 end is just not a very good baseball player. But once you put those numbers on a page, they become analytics. And so they become foreign and they become a little bit scary. And I think one of the things that we can all do in our industry, just say like all, all of the information is a piece of the puzzle. And you know, once we break it down into its smaller parts, it's, it's not all that scary. Okay. You've been around this game for a long time and I was at spring training and I had some fun with some of the guys. Uh, Larry mentioned I played a little baseball in college. I have a baseball card, I don't know if you can see it. Yes. Uh, this is from college. Uh, the guys like to make fun of me, Dubon and Crawford and all those guys had fun with me. Do you have your rookie card, uh, a favorite piece of memorabilia? Like baseball is a game you gather things along the way. Is there something like this that's uh, not as embarrassing but special to you, like your rookie card? Uh, I don't – I'm not a big – I can understand why that would be special to you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, I definitely don't want to diminish the value of, of that card. I have a mustache here for a little bit, so I was pretty proud of it. Wow. I, yeah, I another, that's like. another insult from Dave Kapler on this podcast. No. <laughs> Insults for 500. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not huge on memorabilia. I, okay. I don't really keep a whole lot, um, but I will say that a, a world series ring is, is one yeah. that um, is, is really important to me. And it's probably not that important to me until it, it comes out once in a while. And I get to show it to somebody who has a real connection to that mm. for, you know, world series team. And probably most importantly, I want to be able to give it to my to my sons. And so for that reason, that's probably the most important piece of memorabilia. But again, just it, those those things, material possessions have never been, you know, all that important to me. It's it's the memories and, um, you know, I can still feel what it feels like to be on the mound with my two young sons in a, a dark St. Louis stadium after winning the World Series. They're crawling around as as essentially babies on the mound everybody's off the field i have a hat on that's soaked with champagne and we just won the world series so for me that moment i don't i don't need anything i don't need a picture of it i can still feel it to this day i can still smell the champagne um that's that's more important to me than than any piece of memorabilia speaking of that real quick fever pitch was filmed and I, those guys ran on the field did you guys did you like fever pitch and, and that movie they were kind of playing that out on the field as you guys won the world series kind of unique I thought it was a good representation of the passion of, of Red Sox fans. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it did a really good job of, of representing how crazy that time was and what a big party it became. Uh -huh. yeah, I, Casey is dying to ask Tiger King questions here. So I know we're, <laughs> the time is short. Oh, I know he, he's the Tiger King. Go ahead, ask, ask your question about uh, Carol. Oh, my God. Uh, Gabe, you know, we had a Vander Kane of the San Jose Sharks on on Monday. And I made the mistake of dropping a Tiger King question to him early in the podcast. And then we spent probably 20 time, uh, 20 minutes talking about it. So I don't want to, I don't want to go down that road, but what are your, what are your theories as it pertains to Carol Baskins? We, we can't really do that though. Right. Because <laughs> we'd be giving stuff away. Like I think so everyone's there, watched it. There, there I haven't like, seen it. I don't know. I know. I know a lot of people who are like on episode one or two. Um, I don't know that we want to kind of dive into to the outcomes or, or anything. I'll say this. Like, I think what was most captivating about that show is the storytelling. I think the storytelling is really strong. Um, you start to start to think deeply about the characters early in the show. And, and the cats are just so incredibly powerful, um, so incredibly graceful, so um, athletic. And the, the appeal is, is real to want to, like, take a look at, to be around cats that are that powerful. Um, as, as somebody who really loves and appreciates animals, it's, it's kind of a sad show at the same time. Uh, but I don't, I don't want to give anything away for people. It's, uh, it's an interesting watch. And I feel like you dive too deep and we're giving, giving clues. Yeah, that's fine. We could take this a different direction, though. As a major league baseball player, have you ever had a teammate that actually like owned a big cat or were interested in that kind of thing? Because I know that certain people in the sporting world have, have definitely dabbled in owning large animals and exotic animals themselves. I've, I've, I've never been around a, a player who's, who's owned a big cat. Um, I mean, look, like I, I have a, I, I had a, a big pit bull 
that I absolutely adored and spent so much time with. And that was enough, right? Like, I mean, you know, being, being around a, a wonderful, warm and kind of um, big teddy bear kind of animal like that, but still like really powerful, th that was enough in, in my opinion. You said big cat, I thought Andres Galarraga. I thought we're, that was where <laughs> this was going. A different, a whole different thing. Uh, we'll run out of time. We haven't touched on classical piano and your, your dad, Sure. Did, does he still play the piano? And I know Casey was, was mentioning that your, your folks are in New York, so maybe tie it all together with the piano and, and, and New York is going through a lot of issues right now. Sure. Um, well, my, my mom and dad are still in the house that I grew up in in Southern California. So they, they were both born in New York and came to, came to L.A. So they're both in L.A. now in the house right. that I grew up in. Uh, my dad still plays the piano every day. Uh, my dad is doing that in, in a lot of ways to, to kind of stay sharp and strong. Um, I grew up listening to him play the piano. Um, he introduced me to Mozart and Schubert and Beethoven. And um, those are, you know, anytime I hear classical piano, anytime I hear um, classical music, period, I think about my dad. So um, that's an easy one to go through, particularly in times like these. I've had more opportunity to talk to my dad um, and my mom, my brother in the last couple of days than I have in a while. It's been kind of a blessing and, and surprise. Um, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about my two sons as well. So these are those times when you, like you said, tie it all together, think about what it was like in your house growing up and, and really appreciate your loved ones. Gabe, last one from me. Um, do you think when we get back to the games and, and playing and hopefully in front of full fans, are you going to have a, greater found respect for the game is it going to mean more to you like did we take it everything for granted because I know I look at the world a lot differently now yeah I think I think that's a good point I, I do think that people are going to really appreciate uh, the things that that make their life rich and I think baseball is one of those things both for people in the industry coaches managers players and and definitely for fans I think uh, when the time comes that we're able to get back on the field I think we're all going to appreciate the game a little bit more. And I think we're all looking forward to that. Yeah. Casey, right, Larry, one last question. You can bring us home. I, I just have one uh, workout question for you because I'm kind of a workout <laughs> nut myself. Um, <laughs> what's the one exercise in the gym that you miss the most right now? I think there, so there's two, there's two exercises that if, if you could only do these two exercises, um, you'd, you'd be really strong for, for as long as you were doing them. And that's, that's the squat and the deadlift. I'd say those are the two traditional exercises. I also think sprints are um, as good as it gets as well. So like running as fast as you possibly can. Um, but those are the two that, that, would, that would top my list. What about for you? Man, I miss all of it. Um, <laughs> we're doing actually a plank challenge. Yeah, I was gonna mention the planks. You can jump in on this if you want. Uh, well, the funny thing is, uh, Casey and I, uh, a couple years ago, we started doing the push-up challenge. We got up to 75 push-ups in a row. Wow. And then, yeah. And then I hurt my wrist, and he hurt his shoulder, and that's the end of that. <laughs> Did you guys – you guys hurt, hurt, got hurt doing push-ups? No, it was just – I think it was general wear and tear because we were doing three sets of 75 a night in the office. Wow. Because we started, like – we started at the goal of a hundred a day and then it just, it just got out of control. And I think the wear and tear just messed us up because we did way too many, but, but now we're doing planks. So, um, you know, our initial goal when we were together in the office every night was just to add like five seconds each night. Um, we're, we're about at four minutes now, but no way, um, really? I've fallen off the wagon a bit, but, uh, do you have a plank time that you can register? No, I can't. I mean, I've, I've done planks in the past and, I'd be interested to hear more about your challenge, but I don't think that I could keep up with you guys right now. Definitely not on the push-up front. I can't remember the last time I did 75 push-ups in a row, um, but I'd be interested. So throw the information my way. Maybe I'll join in. Nice. Yeah, basically we're just trying to get to as much time as possible. There's a, a Marine, 62 years old, and I was corrected by other Marines saying, there's no such thing as a former Marine. You're just a Marine, Right. 62 years old, Dude held the plank for over eight hours. No way. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Hey, listen, pe people are strong. I'd love to see. Uh, I'd love to see that. That'd be incredible.
Yeah, um, we we can shoot you that that video. It's it's on uh, it's on Twitter and stuff. But cool. uh, we're gonna we're gonna work on our planks and uh, can't wait to see you at the House of Prime yeah. Prime Rib. But more importantly, in a baseball uniform at Oracle Park with some games to watch. Yeah, you know what? I, I love it. Like those are those are two goals that I'm excited about. And right now, I think we all need uh, need some carrots, right? Something to to look forward to something to work towards. So I really appreciate you guys taking the time with me. Thanks, no, well, we, Yeah, we appreciate your time, because, uh, cause, I mean, it's just special to have you on. And uh, and like I said, can't wait to see you uh, back up in the Bay and uh, when we're, we're watching baseball games for real. So thanks again. Looking forward to it. I appreciate you guys. With authority.